you want to bring us in though? No. Why? Because it's no. It's not my. You almost said it's your podcast. Yeah. Well, based on what's <laughs> we in can here, talk about it, it later. Guten Morgen. Guten Morgen. Yeah. 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 Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Emotion Chips, where we talk about the real reason everything happens for a reason. I'm your host, Charlie Carroll, along with my can do co host, Mallory uh, Redmond. You're running out. You're running out. Hi. Welcome to the program, Mal. Thanks. Glad to be here. Today we are joined by a very special guest on the podcast. Now looking around. <laughs> Mr. Brent Wagner. Wow. Siri always has a wonderful time pronouncing your name when I tell her to call Brent Wagner. Wagner. Yes. Because she, she it's spelled German. weird? No. No, it's if, if you. He's like, no, I'm actually weird. <laughs> yeah. If you look at it, uh, it looks like Wagner. Yeah, there's an extra e. Well, I the extra e is for eccentric. Oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's what I was told when I was younger. Welcome to the program, Mr. Wagner. Very happy to be here. It, we are so excited to have you on the program, where we're going to talk about energy in the form of wine. Nice. Yes, for those of you that do not know, Mr. Wagner is the executive vice president of wine at Heidelberg, which is the largest distributor in Ohio, correct? Ohio, correct. Yes, and you've been with them for how many years? Well, 33 years and uh, nine months and about nine days. See, so if you're, if you're going to love wine, you, you have to have this kind of like makeup to you. Yeah. That, that, that yeah, you're 30, into the, 34 the years details. is coming up quick. No kidding. Yeah, a couple months. But that's not why he's here, ladies and gentlemen. He's here because he is in love with the idea of wine. Oh, good. What'd you think we were going to say? I thought it was going to be one of you. Oh. oh. <gasps> Ooh. Because we're in love. <laughs> that would be spicy. <laughs> Send in your vote. Is Mr. Wagner in love with me, your host, <laughs> or Mallory Redman, our can-do co-host? What a fun game. Uh, let's let's start with how long you have been at this. So I'll just say this. You are my favorite wine person to be around. Oh. I'm going to blush. Well, wow. I think I am blushing. You actually. are. That's great. Um, I have the privilege of being around a number of wine people, a lot of wine people that just absolutely love all things wine to include some master psalms. And what I love about you is you are very practical and you're very like, functional. You're not a, you're not a wine snob. You're just like in love with wine. Yeah. And so we've had the privilege of knowing each other now for a handful of years and we've gotten to travel together. Two years, three months and what? <laughs> right. Here, here we go. A couple days. Yeah. You know better than I do. Well, and, and like it you, was October. Wow. You know, How'd you meet? Table 33. Oh, what's that? Uh, it's this fine dining establishment actually just up the street from here. Nice. Way, to, way to go, can do go. Thanks. <laughs> uh, Farm to table. Yeah. yeah. Sounds great. And a fan, one of the f most fantastic chefs in town. That's that very is true. true. Very creative. Very yes. true. M Mr. Vance. Mr. So you just started coming in there and you met Charlie? I met Charlie through uh, one of his old associates. Nice. That is a true. They parted ways and... Um, and you guys, here you are. We stayed together. And we stayed together. <laughs> what a love story. Just another clue as to who he might be in love with. <laughs> True. True. So talk to us about how you got started with falling in love with wine. Uh, you know, there. I'll have to make this the shortened version because there sure, were yeah. times in my life where I exposed to wine because I remember, actually, my family is mostly German, but Thanksgiving, Easter, Thanksgiving, Christmas were traditional family dinners and mom would pull wine out because she thought it was very proper to have wine. And I remember being 10, 11 years old, and she would pour Cala Rossi Rhine or Chablis, which, by the way, they weren't Riesling and they weren't Burgundy, but Cala Rossi Gallo, you know, used those, abused those names back then. But she would pour like an ounce in your glass and fill it with water. And uh, you were allowed to have a toast with, uh, with the adults, if you will. It's beautiful. It was. And then fast forward... The, the next iteration was you are young and you want to try things, and those are the sweet versions like a Boone's Farm or 
Mogan David 2020, we should have known last year was going to be tough because Mogan David made 2020, right? I, and then uh, fast forward till I was bartending and uh, working at a lounge, and I was actually dating a girl who was quite a bit older than me. And uh, we, we, our first date, we went out to dinner. She took me to this fancy restaurant, and we had Pui Fousse. Champagne. Say it again. And yeah. What? Pui Fousse. Champagne. And then we had a bottle of Bordeaux. And I thought, oh, my God, I could go out with this young lady. Well, she was a little bit older than me. My mother didn't <laughs> like me at that point in my life. Sure. And I was fascinated because Pui Fousse tasted really nice. And champagne was incredible. And all the time I ever drank sparkling wine in my life, it was like Osti or something inexpensive and cloying. The key here was cloying. This wasn't cloying anymore. It was refreshing. And, uh, and she inspired me to want to learn about wine. And I remember we'd go to this. There was a wine club in Toledo and a wine shop that turned into this wine-by-the-glass place. If it existed in downtown Dayton today, it would work. The environment, the setup, everything was just absolutely right on. And uh, we'd go there and taste wines, and my buddies were like, hey, why don't you go out with us? We're going out on Bowling Green and, you know, play some pool and, you know, check out the girls and whatever. I go, okay, so go out with you, drink beer, puke in my shoes, or I could go out to dinner, have this beautiful dinner, have nice wine, dance, and, you know, what a night. No. Now, now was she, because she was older, was she buying? She bought quite a bit. But I actually, at the time, worked two jobs, so I had some income. Back in those days, I was actually making as much money as I was 10 years later working at Heidelberg. Wow. Because I was bartending. I, I would sell my services out to people, so I'd do Christmas parties or birthday parties or whatever. I'd go to a house in Ottawa Hills, which is kind of like Oakwood here, right, in Toledo, yeah. and they'd pay me like $200 in cash plus tips. And I'd go there for like four hours, set up do the whole bartending thing, and I'd get $250 in tips, come home with $450 in my pocket thinking, I don't think I ever want to grow up and go to school. Right. <laughs> Why would you? Yeah, I just want to do this. See, so this podcast, we talk a lot about energy, and emotion is energy in motion. And this is what I'm talking about with Brent. Like, you can't help but like and want to be more interested in wine when you're around you. Like, all of the energy is there. It's in motion. Mm -hmm. So for the person that's listening right now that is not, the big wine drinker, uh, what would you say if, if they're tempted to tune out right now? Well, I think you, um, everybody has their wine. I, I'm really sold into the fact that there's a wine for everyone and everyone has a wine. Um, for me, it's not a wine. Usually the favorite wine for me is the one that's in my glass. And that was something I learned from Robert Mondavi. And it, yes, it is funny, um, but it's, he, he told me, he said, at this moment, at this emotion, in this time in life, that's what's in your glass. It was chosen for you. You chose it. And that's your favorite wine because that's reality, right? Yeah. And I got to really appreciate that. And when I tell people that, sometimes you get the giggles. Oh, yeah, that's because you're drinking. No, I, I think it's more about life. Yeah. And the emotion of life. It's right now. Yeah. yeah. So this is my favorite wine. So I think there's, I've tasted, oh, I would imagine, never really have counted them, but more than 10, more probably, probably more than 20-some thousand wines in my life. And if you think about it, if I think backwards, I could find a wine, I think, for almost anybody's palate. Now, if you don't like alcohol at all, it might be a little bit of a challenge to find you getting past the, because I think people that don't like alcohol, there's a bitterness or a burning sensation or something, right? Right. But there is low alcohol wines now that are actually pretty interesting. We, we, we represent one inside the Wine Trend Sales group called uh, Villa M. And they made a Rosso and then a Bianco, and then they finally... We convinced them to make a rosé, and now they make flavors, but they're like 4.5% alcohol, mm -hmm. and uh, they're delightful. They're absolutely delightful. Yeah. Yes. So I have found that the more I know and the more I'm around you and learn about wine, the more I fall in love with it, and it's just the, the energy of understanding it. Often too many people have such a limited knowledge of what's going on and walk into a grocery store and look at the label and really have no idea about the grape or the history or the vineyard. And there's so much story behind it, which scientifically it's been proven that the story influences how it interacts with your body when you're drinking it. Absolutely. I mean, 
there's no doubt there's emotion in every time you take a sip of wine. You know, 70% of all wine sold in grocery stores is bought by ladies, and women choose wine more often than not on either loyalty, wines they're, they're, they've been successful with, they like in the past, or the look of the label. Mm -hmm. So that you could argue that over 50% 50, 50 of all wine is just chosen because of the way it looks. Yeah. And, and um, so it takes great marketing people. And that's why Gallo is still the largest wine company in the world because they understand marketing side. And they do something that people sometimes don't know or don't respect, which is they make very consistent solid wine. It might not be great at the low end, but it's exactly the same. If I tasted a glass of Colorossi Rhine today, I could probably look back 50 years ago and say, I remember this wine. It's exactly the same. Mm. And they have... Uh, um, they have like seven or eight, 18 labs, 17 or 18 labs, and they work on a varietal in the lab or a flavor. It's amazing what they do. Yeah. So they, they put the science behind the passion and the emotion of actually making wine, but they do the science first so they can figure out how it works. Yeah. We have had an opportunity to dine together on multiple occasions. I was reminded by your wife that we're dining together next month and I should be careful. Yeah. Well, <laughs> oh. That is true. There is a story or two where we have purchased. We've indulged. Yes. Some would call it overindulging. I just call it enjoying life. I love. That's good. I love it. I love enjoying life with you. Brett. Yeah. I think it's becoming more and more clear who is in love. Uh -huh. on this yes. Podcast. I'm just going to sit back and watch. Uh, before we go any further, I think you have brought something in your nifty bag for us to well, partake of while we talk. I thought it'd be nice if we, uh, I don't usually drink wine. At Look at this polishing rag. Nine, I know, wow. 9.29 in the morning or whatever time it is here yeah. in the Eastern coast. But um, I did learn a lot from my friends in Germany and you, you have met my cat. Ernst Lozen is my cat's name and he's yes. actually named after one of my dear friends. And, uh, he would tell you stories about what wine would you choose to drink when you either want to sober up or in the morning. And he would say, normally it would be one of his wines, especially one of his uh, Q QBA wines, which be, you would drink these wines because they're low in alcohol. You would drink them to sober up or because they're so low in alcohol. And this wine, for instance, is 8% alcohol. Okay. So pretty low, right? Almost half as much as a lot of California table wines. Sure. Now, for the thousands of fans that are tuning in on yeah. YouTube right now to right. watch what you're doing, would you explain what you're doing? So I cut off the capsule for a nice presentation, and it would get all the foil away from the, uh, the lip of the glass because you want it clean. You can even wipe it off. And then I'm just pulling the cork out. This happens to be, you know, screw caps are becoming a – Big deal nowadays, but this one's actually an old-fashioned cork. Do you think the screw cap will completely replace the cork eventually? No. Okay. No, I think um, there's a couple reasons why. So sometimes people like to smell the corks. Um, Mal, do you like to smell the cork? Well, I want to now because he's doing it. Yeah, it smells like wine, a little bit like cork. So Can I smell? Literally what you would do in the old days, you'd, you'd smell it to... Uh, ensure that maybe there's not an off or foul bacteria in the cork. Yeah. Whoa, 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 wait. Whoa, wait. I just picked up on that. I was in Nashville dining with my father, and I was so proud. Nice. That, that I that I called for the psalm because it just, it did not smell right. Nice. The cork didn't, or the wine? It was corked, which you're going to have to explain to people that corked a corked bottle of wine doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the cork. No, matter of fact, uh, Mark Fisher, our local... Dayton Daily News yes, Entertainment. We, we like know Mark. Mark. White writer. He, uh, he and I were, we've known each other since I moved here. I moved here July 11th, 1994, and we met soon after. And uh, um, we didn't, you know, he's, I'm a distributor. He had to be always careful around me, right? Because he was the wine writer. He was supposed to be the guy who yeah. had no opinion. He was just writing up on what, you know, what was going on. And anyways, uh, he was telling me one time that he was down in Texas and he had been invited as a celebrity judge. And he had smelled this wine. He said, this wine's corked. And about three or four other people in the room, because they do tasting groups, and then you get assigned certain wines, because there might be a thousand wines in the competition. Right. And people started laughing at him. And he looked at him and said, what's going on? He goes, um, it's kind of screw cap. And Mark says, okay. <laughs> it still has TCA in it. Yeah. And um, the industry 
decades ago, I don't think a century ago, decided to call the phenomena of TCA, triochloroanacinol, in the wine. And the reason it, it exists is because it needs moisture, and a cork actually can hold moisture. And glass can't hold moisture. It doesn't go into the glass, if you will, but it can go into the cork. So at some point, someone um, used the word that it's corked. Something's wrong with the wine, which has nothing to do with the cork, as you just said. But it became a, it's a bad term. The industry needs to stop it and call it wine, off wine or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, call it something's off. Mm -hmm. yeah. And off wine, it seems like it's not a good thing. Yeah. Uh, but cork gives you a bad thing because screw cap wine. So TCA can can actually come from a lot of different things. One is actually if you clean your winery and use like bleach uh, or in hot tubs bleach, right? Oh yeah. You you clean you can actually clean so much that you could create this chemical and it could invade your cellars, get into the barrels, whatever. And um, you can also get it from dirty, musty conditions, and it'll grow, essentially. Um, but it gets into the, the wood or the cork, and then eventually imparts itself on the wine. And usually what happens when you get a wine that's off, or in this case, the industry called it corked, you get a wine that would actually normally do a couple things. One, for me, I don't think my nose is as well, is as good as other people. So I don't pick it up all the time. But for me, when you pour this wine, let's say, on your palate and you get no fruit at all, and it's like void of fruit, you're like, something's wrong. Yeah. And then when you get this whole dirty basement, cart, wet cardboard kind of thing, yep, sure. you know, and then you're like, something's not quite right here. And that's what it is. That TCA, it grabs the fruit in it. It, it literally like shuts down the fruit in wine. You know, it can be very corked or it can be very, very lightly corked. Yeah. And you can drink through lightly corked wines. I mean, they're it's not horrible. It's not a disease. You're not going to die from it. But Well, a couple of stories here. He had a very casual reference to a hot tub. We have a hot tub story together. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so now we really know who mm -hmm. I love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But on that same trip where we had a hot tub experience with all kinds of other things, Mr. Wagner... Uh, we were drinking bottles of wine from our birth years, and one was a very old bottle of wine, which I don't know whose birthday that was. But uh, yeah. we we had to send it back. <laughs> what? Yeah. We had to send it back. Which I mean, it was an expensive bottle of wine. Well, it's embarrassing for a restaurant like that because there is a sommelier there. There's mm -hmm. an assistant sommelier there, mm -hmm. and the guy actually he made a bad decision. And, um, you know, the, the only reason you really have a sommelier at a restaurant is to protect your clients so that they want to come back and feel trusted that you're there. And he, and he said something to us that was actually the wrong thing to say at the table. After yeah. I, he came back, we, we summoned him. Th this is the, the nicest wine restaurant in the United States, maybe in the arguably, world. Arguably, right? but it has the largest private collection in the United States, if not the world. Right. Probably the United States. I would not go towards the world, but... Cheers. Cheers, lovers. Cheers. I'll just be back here. Don't worry. So it, you can smell it, right? I can smell it. Yeah. It smells are beautiful. You, are you allowed to smell wine? I think I cleanse? can smell wine. I'm on a cleanse, you guys. Happy New Year. So is uh, mm -hmm. Colleen. So she said she can't come to dinner Friday. I'm like, okay, I'll eat your food. I'm not afraid. I mean, the cleanse is being promoted by a business that I happen to own. <laughs> However, I learned a while ago that for me... For me personally, it's very hard to cleanse at the beginning of the year. And so usually I push it off to February or March when things settle down a little bit. But to all of you cleansers out there over at Body Garage Dayton, like, congratulations. I mean, it's a good, it's a great thing. I think it's a great thing. It's a great thing. It's just thing. not for me. I'm a faster, so. Oh, man, sure. I, I get like tangerine on the nose. Yeah, it's, uh, people say petrol, and I understand where they get the whole idea of petrol, but. Yeah. It's for me. It's actually like a, a tangerine skin because it's not the f it's not sweet fruit. It's the essence yeah. of the oil, right? Yeah, for sure. I I would definitely say. Uh, yeah, it's beautiful. Skin. That makes sense. And you get a little bit of minerality in it. And this is Spätlese level. It, um, this this is really beautiful. It's very beautiful wine, and it's got a few years of age on it. Four years. It's two thousand sixteen. Oh my goodness! The temperature is amazing. <laughs> I'm. Are you kidding me? I mean, are you kidding? 
I, I had, we need um, you to say more. I had this a, is a podcast. A tasting, and there was a University of Minnesota. This is a true story. Minnesota University of Minnesota, um, middle or not middle linebacker, defensive tackle, big guy, and we're tasting wine similar like this, except it was from Robert Madavi. This is back in the. This would be the late 80s or early 90s, and uh, the guy tasted a wine that tasted similar to this, and he says, oh, my goodness, this is like an angel pissing on your tongue. Oh. <laughs> and I looked at him like, <laughs> I don't know how to react to this. Yeah. I want to laugh. Oh, perfect. I want to laugh, but I want to cry. Yes. Oh. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like amazing Hold and on horrible. A no. What? Like. Do not try Hold to tempt a me. A half an ounce is not going to hurt you. You have to. No, it's the principle of it. No, you have to taste it. You my trainer, my trainer is listening to she, this. She won't care. It's a, it's a half an ounce. I promise it will not affect you. Don't do you. a half ounce. Do an eighth of an ounce. Do an eighth of an You just have to taste it. It is amazing. Everybody's going to call me out for not no, keeping to hey, my cleanse. No, Put it in no, your mouth that is not true. It out. Can I spit it out in this glass sure. that you're drinking? Just, yeah, that's fine. Just move it or move it around. Okay. It, it's absolutely amazing. <sighs> I feel terrible. Smell it first. You got to smell it. It's a very special wine. and people uh, You're not kidding. Oh. People find German wines to be difficult to understand. But as as you, why are you freaking out? It's like, tell, so good. But like, it, say so more. Uh, I like the minerality of it. The oh, minerality is genius part. Yeah. It, it, it's, it sits up on a hillside in a little town called Erden in, in the Mosul. And um, the vineyard is actually called Trepschen. Um, so it's oh, called that's really good. It's called Erdinger Trepschen. So German. Oh, I feel like I could chug that. Right. Well, you know, there's a few things going on. One, the scary part is there's residual sugar here, and you, I don't like to drink a lot of wine with a lot of sugar. Yeah. Um, in wine today, and especially in Napa and Sonoma, people are tending to add sugar to Cabernet and Chardonnay, and it's not a good, it's not a good time. Yeah. We don't need more calories in our life. True. Um, but for this style of wine, it's it's very delicious, and it's low in alcohol. So you're talking about 8.5% alcohol. It's about almost half of what a normal table wine would be nowadays. Normal table wines used to be 12%, 13%, and now they're 15 and this, So this is 8.5%. And Ernie would always tell me, this is a vine you drink to sober. <laughs> Something. Two things. Number one, you got to get your mic closer to your mouth. It's falling. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. And, and, and number two, have you seen the movie Moneyball? I do not believe I've seen the movie okay. Moneyball. That first I don't of all, own a television. Your mic is better. And, and second, you're going to have to watch it because Mal hasn't seen it. And there's a line in the movie where Brad Pitt, who is playing Billy Bean, the lead role, says, how can you not be romantic about baseball? And it's just like you drink something like this and you get everything from it. And it's just like, how can you not be romantic about wine? Period. I think it takes a little bit of education to get to that point, but... It, it does. It's just taking you time. You guys would die if you saw me drink wine in earlier years of my life. I mean, just a total abomination. Well, you just had to sit down and, and realize. I can't even tell you. I mean, like, I never cut this thing. I just rip it off. And then sometimes if I can't get the cork out, you just shove it in there. I did that in a hotel room. Yes. Same. Same? Yeah. Well, sometimes you got to figure out. And then you get out. little pieces of cork, and, but you just, you know. Although you can take. It, put it in your shoe and bang it on a brick wall and knock the cork out. I've seen somebody do that before. I've actually done it. Yeah. Now, now you were starting to tell us about this particular vineyard. So this is from Dr. Lozen, and the, the proprietor and the winemaker is Ernie Lozen. He's actually a doctor. He uh, studied, he studied anthropology, archaeology, I'm sorry, archaeology. And he was away doing his archaeology stuff in Egypt and his father fell ill and his mother summoned him home and he decided to go to school to learn how to make wine and because no one in the family wanted to do the winery part of uh, dad's business so he took it over and uh, so hence the name still Dr. Lozen um, but this is from it's called 2016 Erdinger Treption Riesling Spätlese so the German label is very easy in some ways it's Dr. Lozen is the brand it happens to be a man um, 2016 was the year, in the year of 2016, it was actually picked. That was the year the grapes were actually harvested. Erdinger um, is a city. Erding is in uh, the Mosul region, uh, not too far away from Burncastle. And Trepschen is the name of a vineyard that Ernie, he doesn't own it, but he's got quite a few vines in Trepschen uh, Vineyard, which in the town of Erding. 
Um, so Erdinger Treption, Riesling is the grape that mostly grows in a lot of Mosul, if not most of Mosul. Um, you'll get Pinot Blanc and Pinot Gris, and now it's getting warm. You'll get some Pinot Noir, but yeah. Spätlese is a level of ripeness. So it was the most difficult thing for me to comprehend during the picking of the Riesling as you go out and you would find um, there's different levels of QBA, quality wine, and uh, the lowest would be just QBA wine, and then it would go to Cabinet and Spätlese and Auschlese and Baron Auschlese and Trocken Baron Auschlese, and finally what would be their trophy, their Grand Vin, would be uh, Eiswein. And what happens is it gets to like a Auschlaser or Trockenbauer and Auschlaser uh, ripeness and it gets 20 degrees and freezes and they go out and pick the berries at four o'clock in the morning, bring them back to the winery. And when you go to press a grape that's half frozen, the only thing you get out of it is basically the sugar or the nectar of the grape. You know, the, most of the water is frozen. It stays behind. Mm -hmm. So that's where the word ice vine came from. But this is picked at Spätlese level. So it's a little bit riper than Cabernet. So it's going to have a little bit more residual sugar early on in its life. And then Auschlese would be a little bit more sugar. But what I find fascinating is you let these wines age for a few years. And I have a 2006 that I want to pull out soon of an Auschlese. So when you get another, you know, 14 years in this case, the sugars tend to soften a little bit. And the wine, it, it tends to integrate in the wine, and, and you don't get as much sugar in your mouth, you know, up front. Yeah. This is the functionality of that I'm referring to when it comes to Brent and how lovely he is as a wine guy. Yes. Just, just all of the practical years coming out. From so being much in the, knowledge. Well, I think that's... Can I have uh, a little more? I oh, think yeah. that's all about experience, right? The word experience is underplayed way too often especially by people who may not, may not pay attention. Um, knowledge comes from time a lot of times, right? you got to learn things. Yeah. And I, I think I'm a slow learner, so... Me too. I think it takes time for things to really sink in and really understand it. And, um, and then if you get the passion, whether it be golf or, or wine, then you really dive in. I yeah. think that's when you start... So beautiful. And I didn't want to be the master summy. I didn't want to be the book smart you know, taster, and I get to work with, you've met Mary Horn, who is absolutely amazing. You know, she's advanced level master sommelier, and, and uh, her town is just fascinating to taste wine with her. Um, but uh, I never really wanted to do the book side of it. Yeah, I didn't see where that was going to help me in my career. I was more going to go towards management. And then ultimately now, it's more about, um, there is still a little bit of management, but it's it's really more coaching and mentoring and some sales, and the sales right now, if I was a master sommelier, could could make it be a little bit better. But sometimes people are a little bit, uh, I don't know, either put off or or um, they're not a master sommelier. I don't I don't know that I'm, uh, I want to be in this group because I'm a little bit overwhelmed by it all. So well, and they're having their share of challenges right now, anyways. Yeah, they are. They have uh, they have uh, a group that might be gone soon. You never well, know. I think I read they just elected a new board. Is that correct? I, I had read that they had elected a new board, or they were going to, and but they've got to clean out a lot of problems. You know, it was a male-dominated organization who actually literally, physically, emotionally, mentally abused people, whether they be women or men, and it just was an awful situation. And finally, 21 ladies stood up and said, enough is enough. Yeah. And even if I don't get anything out of it personally, you need to be exposed and the organization needs to be exposed. And it's just sad. I mean, it's a sad thing, sad situation. I mean, there's only 175 Master Sommiers in the United States. Yeah. 175. It's not very many. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. But, but good for those ladies that stood up. Absolutely. Yeah. Should have never gotten that place. And I, I, I've been around quite a few Master Psalms, and I remember being in Germany at, at Ernie's house with three... Master Psalms, when I was at his cousin's residence, we uh, were tasting wine, Robert Vile wines, and uh, I happened to be at the table with three, all three of them, and I was like, I really don't want to be at this table. Yeah. Uh, you know, but no one wanted to be at that table. And uh, it was quite interesting learning a little bit from them. I got a softer side of them after that, but yeah, yeah it's, um, <laughs> it's unfortunate how that went, the way it went, but it is what it is, but... Anyways, mine was more about learning 
uh, about people. I, I got in the wine business from, I went to school to become a biomedical electrical engineer. And after my short stint of learning through with Roberta, learning about wine, that was my kind of my, you know, second or third phase. I was like, you know, and I, I was running a nightclub as a senior in college, big nightclub, 400,000 people, it's an amazing place, 30,000 square feet. And I was around wine people occasionally, but mostly, you know, beer and spirits. But my wine rep at the time said, you should come work for Heidelberg. So I went and applied because I was just getting burnt out in the, you know, the lounge business. And I got the job, which in some way shocked me. But um, I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to sell wine. So I went over and told my mom. And my mom looked at me. She, I said, I got a job. She goes, oh, my God, my third son's going to be an engineer. And I'm like, oh, no, no, no. I got a job selling wine. Yeah. <laughs> deflated. <laughs> it was, she was very much deflated until I took her to California. Her and my dad. And then they, after they met Mike Benziger, Tom Fetzer, and Robert Mondavi, they looked at me and said, we get it. It's beautiful. Because it's, it's a people business. It really is. It's yeah. a people business. And it's more about family and passion than it is about business, it seems to be. I, I often wonder about that. Uh, I have a little bit of a European heritage myself. And with our country being as young as it is, it's interesting how the more I learn, uh, enjoying life really comes back to those deep relationships and being able to do things and enjoy things su such as wine that come from ancient civilizations. Uh, I, I think the first knowledge that we have of wine existing was about 5,000 years ago uh, in uh, the Middle East. And it's just like, these are things that, that transcend time that go way back that tools that people use to uh, go deep or, or develop deeper relationships and appreciate the, the things that transcend any business that you can build or any amount of money or, or number of assets that you would have. So think about that. So what goes around comes around is an old saying, right? 5,000 years ago, they have now found and carbon dated these, you know, amphoras. And they found that they tested the, you know, whatever was left in there. And they, they convinced themselves that they were attempting to make wine and storm in these amphoras. Ironically enough, one of the hottest vessels in the winemaking industry right now is clay amphoras. Crazy. I mean, yeah. here we are 5,000 years removed from mm -hmm. the beginning of wine, if you yeah. will, that we know it. comes back. And it comes all the way back around. And people are fi finding out that it, when you ferment or age in this amphora, it's a whole different taste profile than in a stainless steel tank or wood barrel or, or different shapes. It's, it's actually amazing. Well, it, w it was the Romans that taught us, you know, they started putting lead in their wine as a preservative, and then that didn't work out too people well. People went crazy. Yeah. They did, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And especially people who were wealthy because they were the people who could afford to drink wine. Yeah. The 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 uh, hail Caesar, <laughs> right? These these people, lead's not too good for your brain, apparently. <laughs> apparently. <laughs> they learned that the hard way. Yes. Uh, so, is this something that Heidelberg carries? They do. It's actually in the Wine Trend Sales Company. Um, and um, it's available not everywhere. It's, um, the, he actually makes an entry-level wine called Dr. L, and it's his entry-level Riesling, and it would be around $12 retail. Um, so that would get people interested in, in Ernie's wines to begin with. And this wine would, Spätlese, I guess it would retail for about $40 maybe. Okay. Yeah. Mal, would you hand that to me? Of so course. I have my Vivino app where I just catalog all of the wine I drink, in order to order more of it or buy it whenever I need to. Nice. Speaking of wine apps, another app that you turned me on to was the Win Wine app. Yeah. Uh, for those of you that do not know of this, you need to. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, because I, you know, um, when some, someone wine. told me about it about three or four years ago, I think it's been four years ago now, and um, it's free service if you want to look at today or look backwards in time. But if you want to look forward in time, you have to pay them. And I remember four years ago, it was $1.99, and then it was two ninety nine. Now it's $3.99 a year. It's gotten very expensive. $3.99. For the year. Well, and I, I literally use it to plan out tasting. So yeah. 
all the research out of it. It was not made to be a wine uh, study per se, but this German woman, um, her son's still alive and still owns the company, if you will. But what she did is she cataloged every day of her life. She cataloged what she did, like in planting and where the constellations and, and where the moon and where the constellations were and realized that she planted green beans on Monday and let's say the constellations were aligned a certain way and Wednesday they were different, that when she harvested them, they actually tasted different. Same soil, same... Um, yeah, same bean. Same beans, same everything. And so she documented this. She actually kept 50-some years of records and her son now owns them. But this uh, UK team... Um, um, met them through time and through people and said, well, that would relate to wine, right? Wine is grapes. It's, it's harvesting. It's why wouldn't it be the same? And it really works on this whole idea of biodynamics, right? Biodynamics are a little bit different and we, I don't want to get too far into biodynamics because I don't know enough about it, but it's very specific, specifically, you're really trying to do anything about the earth, although ironically enough, you can't use sulfur and sulfur is a, a real live, uh, you know, product. And I don't know why they can't use sulfur, but you don't, but anyways, it's based on biodynamics and there are certain days when wine tastes fruitier yeah. and it's, um, and I, I bought the, uh, you know, I, I advanced my, you know, today's is a root day. So today in, and I've done this so many times, I, um, I would say it smells good, um, but when it's a flower day, it smells so much better. Now, now explain the difference between a root and a flower day for those that do not know and are wondering what in the world you're talking so about. So what this woman found out was there's 12 constellations and that they seem to be in a certain space and time and that they three of three different sets of them being aligned were one type of uh, planting or growing or tasting, and then three were another three were another three. So she found that she figured out that there were four cycles. And what these people did with to relate it to wine was actually gave the cycles names of flower, fruit, root, or leaf. And what we're learning over time is that there is no doubt on a flower day when you take a fruit wine or a you know wine that is very uh, driven by the bouquet that they pop in your nose on those yeah. days. Mm. And this wine smells good. It's a root day, but it smells good, but it yeah. doesn't pop like it would, I think, in a, in, a, in a flower day or a fruit day. And what we're also finding out, and, and then people will say, well, I'm not going to ever drink on a root or leaf day. Well, half the time or more, it's going to be a root or leaf day, or it's in between cycles. So you you can only drink half the time, whatever. But we're finding out that, Root and leaf days, I find it very interesting to drink older wine and it's showing older wine. It's because they're also saying that um, um, because of the older wines that root and leaf days, you might be picking up stuff um, that's deeper in the wine. So when it gets a little bit older, you're picking up maybe more of the nuances during those times. Which I would swear before I knew about this app that I would have the exact same wine. And it would taste different to me. And, and and so then when you started explaining it or you told me about the app, like we talk about all the time on this podcast, just like entanglement and uh, quantum physics and how everything is connected. And so when you sit down and something is going on with uh, the solar system or the constellations, like there is no separation when it comes to energy. It's all connected and therefore how it tastes in your mouth on one day, a specific day or time, uh, is different when the energy of the earth is different, let alone the people you're with. Uh, I think Robert Madavi taught you that, right? Just the importance of, of who you're drinking wine with and how everything is connected and therefore everything changes based on who you're with and, and when you're doing it and where you're at in the world. Yeah, you could, and there's been proven to myself, but things I've read over the years are, the three of us could sit down and taste wine every single day, you know, Monday through Sunday, if you will, and taste the same wine blind in certain days, we would not know what they are yeah, because they would taste different. And, and part of that's your own body, right? Right. Sure. And what you're going through. I mean, I'm convinced of this when people say, oh, I went to the 
you know, table 33 the other day and they had their steak. It was okay. And I said, don't you ever think that sometimes it's the same exact cut of meat and it's next door to the other cut of meat and maybe it's you, not the meat? No, Nobody. Nobody thinks it, that. No. No, it's always, you know, it's always someone else's fault or yeah. someone else's problem. I said, sometimes I think it's just you. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, we we know that when you are in a state of fight or flight, you know, via anger or feeling out of control or fearful that your brain reorients itself and turns off certain breakers in the body because it wants as much energy to go into your limbs, your legs and your arms so that you can fight that saber tooth tiger off versus all of the blood being around your visceral organs, which when the blood is around your visceral organs, like that is where everything functions from. Uh, 80% of your immune system is in your gut. And, and so living in the day and age where we have so many, so many of these preservatives and additives in our food, like a lot of people don't have the energy that they want to have because the center of who they are is compromised because the blood primarily lives in their legs and their arms and in the back of their brain versus the front of their brain. So if you are in a state of fight or flight and you're always stressed, like there are certain things that you're not going to be able to enjoy in life because they need more of your processor on than not. Well, especially if you have a high acid wine and you're all stressed out, you got more acid in your whole entire right. system. 100%. And you're getting a wine that you're like, oh, this is, I don't like this wine. Why is that? It's very acidic. I go, maybe it's you. Sure. You know? Well, the, the, the amount of people that are dealing with acid reflux you know, similar to, to what you just said that you'll walk in and, and, and try to have a meal and you'll never, con a lot of people will not consider their orientation walking in to that meal and how they've uh, thought throughout the day or if they're in a state of fight or flight where a lot of their conscientiousness is shut down and they'll blame it all, you know, on the restaurant or their experience, not knowing that your demeanor and how you walk into any given situation determines what you experience. Uh, we were just talking about this, that if, if you are uh, complaining, the energy, you know, everything has a frequency. And so when you complain, there's a, there's a certain frequency there that's lower, probably around 35 Hertz type of thing. A Hertz is, is how many times something vibrates per second. Uh, when you're joyful and you're laughing, the hertz go up to around 60, 65, 70. What, what you come to understand when you study energy is that whatever you function at on an average is what you draw to you. And so we were just saying the other day that if you are complaining or you're down and you're, you're focused inward, then if you're functioning at 35 hertz, you're going to draw more 35 hertz situations towards yourself whether that's a meal, whether that's a person, whether that's a circumstance, like if you are a complainer, you will always draw more situations in your, uh, in your life to you to complain about. If you are thankful and, and grateful and practice gratitude and you function at a high level, you will draw to you more situations like that to be grateful for. And so uh, I use the word receivership, mm, mm -hmm. uh, which actually, which actually turned out to be a word that thankfulness is the, the mode that puts you in receivership. And so like, I got a little excited about this wine today. And when I do, and I raise my hurts to do that, I put myself in a biologically, I put myself in a position to draw more, oh my gosh, this is good type of situations to myself. You know, for me, who is who is a person that loves to study faith, it takes a lot of faith to get into the energy and the connectedness of things. But but as we've said on this podcast before, you know, uh, Japanese scientists have have split an atom and separated them, taken one of them to space with the Russians and left one here. And when they started spinning one of them in space, the other half of it started spinning in the same direction at the same pace here, just proving how all of this energy is connected. And, and what I love about something that can appear to be so superficial, right? Like most people will approach wine and look at it in a grocery store and think that there's very little difference to it. What I love about it is you can get really into the details and into the character and disposition of the grower and how they maintain uh, their property 
that affects everything that is in this glass. And if you are in tune and aware of it, you're going to get to experience all of that goodness and all of the life that actually exists in this glass. Ernie actually has a United States imported company, and it's uh, probably on the back of the bottle, imported by Lozen Brothers USA. And uh, his philosophy early on was he only wanted to do business with people. He wanted to bring his wine to America, but he wanted to bring other people's wines to America. And he didn't want anybody necessary from his region unless there was a, a story to tell or something to tell. And now I think he might have eight or nine German brands in his portfolio. And there's, there's a, there's a story, there's a point of difference and there's a respect and a different, not only passion, but a different uh, way to look at how they're making wine or where they're making wine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but, uh, he, he appreciates it and understands that I mean, he thinks his wine is the best, but there's, there's a lot of other choices out there for people to make. Yeah. And he wanted to bring them to people because I, I reasoning if I used to tell people if I was ever on a stranded Island and there was only one white grape, I'd probably want it to be Riesling. Especially if you're on a desert island, you want something that's refreshing and yeah. and light and you know not overwhelming. But it's hard to argue with white burgundy. But they're actually making wine. Ernie was part of the new renaissance. You know, half a century ago, um, Ernie's father, grandfather, they used to make dry wines, and and Riesling started getting sweeter, especially based on Spätlesen, Auslesen, those you know quality wines. But the wines got sweeter and sweeter because that was an American thing. Americans drink a lot of wine from Germany yeah. and the English drink a lot of wine from Germany. So, um, there, there was a movement to really start back in 2010. And, uh, I w remember when I was last over at Ernie's house, he had, it was 2016. He had an 11 sitting in a barrel still for five years. It fermented. Now it was just sitting in a barrel aging. And, uh, it fermented all the way through. So instead of being eight and a half percent residual or uh, alcohol, it would be about 12 and a half, 13%, probably 13%, but it's dry because it's taken all the sugar and fermented it into alcohol and carbon dioxide. So now you've got a little bit higher wine with less sugar, uh, residual sugar. Um, and you leave these in barrels and they become almost like a white burgundy. They're extraordinary. They're rich and fleshy and there's more shape to them. This wine, when it enters my palate, seems to be more direct. It's like right at me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then in the mouth, because of the, I think, the quality of the wine, it tends to move around and flatten out a little bit um, because it's it's it definitely is round. And I think sugar does that for me sometimes. But these wines are gorgeous. They're just big and rich. And you're just like, oh, my goodness. And if you don't take the time to actually smell it and taste it like we're talking about, you won't get it. Um, you really got to sit down and understand it, put it in a glass. I actually served it in a Monterey glass to Bo and Bo looks at me and goes, this isn't Burgundy. This is Riesling. I go, good for you. Nice. I said, taste it. What do you think? He goes, well, it doesn't, it smells like Riesling, but it doesn't taste like Riesling to me or not any Riesling I've ever been exposed to in my life because it had been barrel aged and sat in a barrel for three or four years. And it was just this unctuous, round, beautiful thing. Which talk about the importance of glassware just for one second. Well, I'm a that, that not all wine glasses are created equal. No, and I'm I'm really a glass geek, and I'm well, I'm the Riedel authorized Riedel person for Ohio and Kentucky. Um, but so these are all Riedel, and they're varietally specific. So in this case, it's a Riesling glass. Um, they even make a Grand Cru Riesling for these better Rieslings that it's a little bit taller and it's got a little bit wider. But their functionality, it's all about science. So Riesling tastes better physically when it's more directed towards the back of your palate, hence a thinner glass, and it tends to direct it more in your palate backwards. So it hits, and then when you close your mouth, to it you know, it'll come forward, and then you physically swallow it. So it kind of comes in, comes back, and goes back, right? Well, Burgundy, the glasses are very much round and wide, and when you pour them in to splash them on your palate, they tend to hit across the palate more and not so deep, and they're a little bit more shallow. And it's physically what, what George Riedel and I think Maximilian is the 11th generation doing vessels back into the 1600s, 1700s. 
what George became known for is varietals because he broke down the DNA of the varietal yeah. and figured out your palate and the varietal and how it affects the entry right. point and especially the, the bouquet. I mean, this is really directing the bouquet to a smaller point. So the bouquet should be a little bit more intense, right? If it was a wider glass, it would tend to come out of the glass easier. So that's why he spent so much time, energy, and centuries, if you will, the family did, of constructing the perfect vessel. You know what I love about this and what wine can teach us? Tell us. It is just how much can be, pardon the pun here, right under your nose and you have absolutely no clue. It's amazing. And, it, and it's, it's true of the rest of life. Yeah, well, what I keep thinking about is just, I mean, what we always come back to is just awareness. Like you just described so many things that most people would just like pick up their glass and drink it and keep going. And that's available. I love what you said about how your your favorite wine is the one in your glass. Like that is just a practice of gratitude. And people just like can skip right over that. But it's true for what you drink and what you eat and who you're with and the conversations you're having and the way that you like experience just like walking outside, like just like noticing every part of what your senses are picking up on. Well, and how about just being present, right? Like, Well, and that, I think Robert Mondavi said that at the beginning of that conversation also because I asked him about drinking expensive wine, and, and he, made, he made his, ironically enough, his favorite wine was his reserve Cabernet, if you will, or his reserve Pinot Noir, and he said, I would never go home and just open those up and drink them by myself in the back patio, those would be times where I'd open up those bottles of wine to share with friends or family and, and, and get inside of the wine. Mm -hmm. And again, he said that again, that would be my favorite wine because I chose it because of who I'm with, where I'm at, what I'm around environment wise. Yeah. But it, if, and some people just can't get over that and they're like, yeah, your favorite wine is whatever's in your glass. Ha ha ha. Cause you're drinking wine. I go, no, it's not about that. Yeah. Cause there are times where I don't want to drink wine. Right. Sure. Not very well, many, but... <laughs> right. Well, but it, it just comes back to, I mean, talk about the story of life that you can go out and buy wine that is mass manufactured that has a ton of artificial chemicals and flavors and, and everything else in it. And like, there's no difference between this bottle and the next for you. But true to life, like when you stop and slow down and try to observe what is there, like there is a huge reward for those that... uh you know, are aware and, and want to become more aware to the details and the nuances uh, of life. Yeah. I mean, this wine, when you, I'm, I'm, I'm literally glass, chewing it. Well, it, <laughs> I am literally chewing this wine. It is so good. It's got some richness to it, which allows it to feel like it's almost thicker. Yeah. Even no, though exactly. people, most people can't understand that because I, Someone told me the other day, I, uh, Franzia box, right? They make the Franzia in the big box. Finally, yeah. Oh, yeah. People go, that wine's horrible. I go, don't you think it's horrible? And I, no. Oh, you like it? I go, you're missing the point here. The wine's not bad. It's more inert than it is poor of quality, right? It lacks flavor. It lacks things that ultimately impress me about wine. But that doesn't mean it's bad, Right. right. It's made scientifically, it's made beautifully and it's made all natural and it's just mass marketed and there's nothing wrong with the wine, but it's not bad. It's, it's more inert. If you yeah. taste the Chardonnay, to me, it actually doesn't smell or taste like Chardonnay. It's another thing I love about you. And when I say that he, that Brent is not a wine snob, wine snobs will make you think that their standard is the standard. Mm -hmm. What is so beautiful about you, and I think this goes beyond just wine for you, having hung out with you and been in a hot tub with you. Okay. Keep it, going. It, Keep it, going. It, Move. Yeah, right. <laughs> Sp spent a lot of money with you. It, is that like, it, it really does come back to when when you have helped me with wine education. It's like, what a, and I say this to Mal, like, it is whatever you think it is. So when I ask you to smell it and tell me what you're smelling, like, what you smell is what you smell. And, and there's such a key to life there when it comes to people. Like, your opinion is your opinion. And and I want to hear it. And, and again, this transcends wine for you, Brent, with, with how I've been around you outside of wine. Like, no, there is no wrong answer here. What, what you are picking up on in this situation is what you are picking up on 
And, and you need to use your voice and not be shy to say, this is what I get. Yeah. And, and, you know, whether it's peanut butter or an old gym shoe, like if that's what you pick up on, a lot of life begins when you have a level of confidence to acknowledge and be okay with just saying like, hey, I don't care if people laugh at me, but this is what I see. This is what I'm hearing. Well, I think sometimes the package itself actually changes your palate in the sense of your brain, right? Sure. So if you're drinking this gothic black bottle with blood on it and stuff and you pour it in and it's just thick, rich red wine, you're like, yeah, this is what I want. This is like, it's marketing. I mean, yeah. back to your hot tub story, the guy who owns the house... Or he's the manager. We Are we finally here, telling here, the hot tub story? No, no. But yeah. you okay. talk about marketing and, and presentation. So we get all the way to the top of the of the building, and he goes, "Oh, by the way, there's a hot tub out there," and um, we go over to roof. it, and a hot tub on the roof. It's beautiful, and we're like, "Is it clean?" He goes, "Oh, it should be really decent." Oh, we just cleaned it a week or two ago. Really decent, yeah, and we all look at each other like. Wow, that's good marketing. This is going to be really decent, decent. wine. Yeah, that it's does not It's so inspire funny confidence. that you remember these exact words. Unbelievable. And I looked at him like, you shouldn't be the marketing guy. <laughs> of anything. Of anything. And of course, we go up there and pull the, the lid back. And it smelled so bad. Yeah, it's less And he had to decent. pour a gallon of Clorox bleach in it. It was, but it, this whole idea of marketing, coming back to the label, I think it speaks to you sometimes, and especially sure. some people who pay attention. The label will speak to you, and that will guide you in, the, in your tasting of the wine. Mm -hmm. But that's what it comes back to. Like, literally, the people that ultimately do not understand or get wine are the people that are reading the blogs or they're studying whatever about it, and they almost try to shame you because you don't think the way that they think, yeah. which is ridiculous. It is ridiculous because we're all individuals. A hundred percent. Everything's going to taste a little different to all of us. Without a doubt. Just this morning, Charlie thought that Gelman's sweater was green. And Gelman says, it's not green, it's gray. Everybody sees it. Did you ever see the blue, the, um, the gold dress? No. Some people thought it was white and gold. Some people thought it was blue and black. You John, don't remember this? Were John, you living under a rock? John was wearing a dress. <laughs> I, I transitioned it, too quick. Oh, okay. Exactly. <laughs> I, I do, roughly. It was like a really big deal. Very yeah, viral. Roughly. All of that to say, nobody was wrong. Well, I guess somebody was wrong, but everybody sees something or well, hears something or I think something the thing, differently. I've had a lot of mentors in wine business, and luckily Robert Mondavi was one of the early ones, but perception is reality. Sure. And, and it's not wine, it's life, right? And... You know, I, I just painted my wine cellar um, a color, and that color happens to be Merlot. And people said, that's grape color. I said, well, this looks more like grape color to me, but Merlot is actually this more reddish kind of thing. Yeah. It's interesting, but it, it sets you up for thinking when you walk in the wine cellar now, you're like, I just have this mood that I want to drink some red wine. Yeah. It is. It's, it's mental, right? For I sure. love it. Last question for you today. Okay. Where does someone start? If, if right now they don't have a lot of knowledge or they're not in love with wine, but they want to give it a shot, where would you say they start? Well, two things. If you're a consumer versus if you want to get in the industry, that's a little bit more complicated. You'd sure. want to f probably find a job somewhere, although the restaurant business is a little challenging right now or wine shops. But I think the e easiest way to start is we have so many professionals in the industry. And whether it be... You know, the Kroger's of the world or Myers, you know, they have choices and they have better wine. Um, but I also like to tend to t tell people to go to somewhere local, like Arrow Wine and, and Spirits or Dorothy Lane Market, because they've got experts sure. who are standing there all the time they're open and someone in there can help you and guide you towards something that you understand. And Dennis Batty, a friend who's worked at Arrow Wine for probably 40 years in, in Dennis's questions to meet a new person are pretty straightforward. What have you drank in the past and what price point are you looking for? Because you got to give me an idea, right? Just get me into the ballpark and I'll find your seat, right? That kind of, yeah, yeah. I, I want to sit in left field in Fenway. Well, it's a green wall. There really are no seats there, so you can't sit there. Mm -hmm. So if you get me in the ballpark, 
and tell me the price range and the kind of flavor or wines you drank in the past that you enjoyed and why you enjoyed them, then I'll help you there. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the easiest way for people to start, start, find an expert, find someone. And there's independent wine shops up and down the street. There's quite a few of them actually. And, uh, you know, the state of Ohio got out of the liquor business and a lot of those places now have spirits and wine. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I think it's a draw for people and beer, but, um, I, I'd find a, find someone you feel comfortable with. It's the same thing I told Laura Katana. I was helping her with her sons and they had been playing golf with their dad. They love the game. And I said, all right, I've listened to you talk for about 10 minutes. And I think I understand exactly where you're coming from. I think if your husband never stands on the practice range with your kids again, it'd be a great thing. And every time they go play golf, it's more about the moment of being with dad and not about the score or your swing is perfect or anything. Of course, your dad should compliment you, but find the coach or find the person or mentor who you, your kid understands and your kid likes, and that way they can engross themselves into it and then finally, when it's time with dad, don't, don't, don't create a bad atmosphere. Create a memory. Mm-hmm. So when you're 20 years old and you come back from college, you're like, I want to play golf with dad. Yeah. It was like the greatest day of my life, right? Yeah. So same kind of concept. Find someone who can coach you and mentor you and get you to a new place. And then I think the next step after that is some of that's on your own. How do you, how do you wade through the water and start thinking about what you want to learn? Yeah. Maybe you don't like red wine, so you start tasting some red wines with people and get into red wine and understand what it is. Yeah. And maybe there are red wines that you love. Yeah. I love it. That's great. Brent, thank you for joining us on the podcast. It's been incredibly uh an incredible morning because I usually don't have wine at nine nine or eleven in the morning. So great. isn't it great? Yeah. Uh, This podcast episode is brought to you by Dumb Wine Deals, (laughs) a little project that Brent and I happen to be working on together. That's good. DumbWineDeals.com. There you go. Be there or be square. (laughs) Nailed it.